Hello and welcome to Unboxing. Today my sparring partner is Rob Pierre. Rob is the CEO of Jellyfish, which has 1,100 employees across the world um, in over 30 countries. Um, they work with the likes of Google, Facebook, Spotify, and Uber, just to name a few. And when I say a few, I really mean that. There are literally plenty of other household name clients that I could mention. Um, so before that, Rob worked um, actually at Sunglass Hut, which um, I'm sure most people will be aware of, um, and was kind of known for bringing in some quite innovative approaches to the business and helping it scale, grow and scale. Um, and I think that's where he like, kind of learned a lot about what he does today. Um, so he is probably the reason that you bought that pair of sunglasses that you, that you really didn't need to on, on, your, on your way through Gatwick Airport. Um, yeah, so, so, so Rob, you know, it's really um, an absolute honor to have him in the ring um, as he's very fast becoming a real thought leader in the space of business leadership and you know how to scale a global company in this day and age and also around kind of business innovation so yeah really looking forward to kind of diving deeper into his story and uh how he's kind of got that perspective um today so yeah without any further ado um i'd like to introduce the ring rob pierre well, what an intro i'm ready i'm ready for you so, uh... up, rob. <laughs> Where would you like to start? Yeah, exactly. No, honestly, thanks very much for um, for giving giving up some time today to um, to have a quick spa. But um, yeah, I wanted to just start off by kind of framing. Prob people are probably wondering, you know, how on earth have I managed to to squeeze in uh, an hour or so, an hour, a couple of hours of, of your time? But um, it's actually quite a funny story. So about this time last year, um, so I run a, a, a company called One Part, which we may come onto a little bit later, but is a kind of golf a new golf startup, which is a new short version of the game around bigger holes. So we occasionally sort of pop up at little festivals or little um, outdoor events, uh, cut our big hole and have people just like hit the ball uh, to, the, to the big hole. And we were, um, there was a couple of people that I knew who worked at Jellyfish um, and they said, yeah, why don't you come along? Um, and we're doing this Jellyfest event, which is, a, which is Jellyfish's um, summer party. So that gives you a little bit of an idea about what jellyfish is like as a company you know doing a summer festival with their work work do um so we so i turned up um and i was cutting the big hole in the side of the, the festival um which was yeah an awesome day <laughs> had a great time um and did really briefly meet rob there and we had a little bit of chat over a couple of pitching wedges um but uh, yeah and i actually <laughs> i actually ended up <laughs> meeting a girl at the festival who is now my girlfriend so not only are you a marketing agency, Rob, but also a bit of a matchmaker, um, which is, you know, which is always a good little side side thing to have. Maybe, maybe create a revenue stream out of that one day. Not sure I can take claim for that one. Uh, I think that's all yours. That was your one. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so, so sort of since then, I've kind of become more, more and more acquainted, I guess, with, with Jellyfish as a company, sort of got a bit of an inside track. Um, and yeah, so a bit of a shout out to, uh, to, to Jenny to, for giving me a leg up and um, yeah, being able to get you in the ring. But um, no, that, thanks a lot. Um, pleasure. But yeah, I, I just, I guess the best, um, best place to start would really be just kind of where it all started for you. Um, you know, a bit, a bit a little bit about your kind of school days, um, how, it was, how you started growing up, you know, was there early signs of you know, entrepreneurship and business or how did it all start for Rob? Well, so if, if you want to know where it all started, let's go right back to the beginning. So I was actually born in Chertsey Hospital and so lived in Woking. Uh, my dad was in the Royal Air Force, so he's from Trinidad and he came over, he met my mum and then so they uh, basically we set up shop in Woking and then at the age of four, we all went back, um, me, my sister, and my younger brother, uh, we went back to Trinidad. And so my whole childhood was actually in Trinidad from the age of four to 14. And uh, if you talk about were there any signs of uh, being an entrepreneur and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurialism, um, I think it was there quite early on. I mean, one of, one of the best stories is that I'd, uh, almost got kicked out of my primary school for selling goldfish. I actually, I actually made ponds in my, 
in my house and I bred goldfish and I brought them in in little bags and was selling them to other <laughs> other students and that was I must have been about 10 at the time and uh, my parents didn't really know they knew I was doing all of the breeding etc uh, obviously the irony is also that my mum was a teacher at that school and somehow she would leave the day she would leave early and go to the school to prepare etc I would then be bagging up the goldfish and going and selling them and then much to her surprise and shock I was called into the principal's office and asked to obviously stop doing that there were a number of reasons why it wasn't appropriate um, and then another story is that uh, my grandpa in Trinidad he had an office that was on the route of the carnival and I don't know whether you know but the Trinidad has the biggest carnival you know the well-known ones are in Brazil and in Trinidad and uh, so knowing this I borrowed some money and I bought a whole uh, a, a few crates of drinks sodas and, and, and uh, soft drinks. And um, yeah, I set up shop right in, in the front of his office building. And I bought, got buckets and ice, etc. And I knew, obviously, in the sweltering heat, that people will be going by, and I could sell it for four or five times the amount. And uh, yeah, so I set up shop then selling soft drinks and making my pocket money. And to be honest, these are stories that uh, my dad actually reminds me of them. It's all it, a, a lot of my past is a bit of a blur. It, it's all just happened so quickly, and obviously you were just naturally doing it uh, as an individual. Uh, but yeah, it was. Uh, these are all memories that uh, are uh, induced by um, the stories that my dad will tell will tell over time. But anyway, so those that's the sign that uh, I definitely going to ask. Like on that, do you think that? being kind of an entrepreneur is something that you are more born with obviously there's this like more you know is it born or made like being an entrepreneur or is it something do you think everyone can can be it's just something I think every everybody can be and, and I, I, I just think it is uh when you see an opportunity if you could see uh where there's an opportunity and just how to get there it's it's more about I would say um whether it's leadership being an entrepreneur it's all around having a vision for what's possible and then motivating people to go on that journey with you. So it's sort of a strategy and a path to getting there. I couldn't have done all these things, how I learned how to breed goldfish, the help I needed to set everything up. I was convincing people to go on this journey with me every step of the way. And I think that persuasion and uh, that leading from well, not even from the front, but that, yeah, I would say it's about getting people motivated to go on that journey makes a massive difference. And I think, I think you could be entrepreneurial without actually having to own your own business. I think uh, it's more about your approach to overcoming problems. It's, uh, it's every time it's being the solution, it's being positive about the, the potential outcome and then having the drive and motivation to go for it. So I think anybody has that in them. Yeah, I, I think that's really well said. I think kind of entrepreneurialism in general kind of is immediately associated with, you know, starting a startup with all these like, you know, business connotations. And it kind of gets a, it gets a bad name. Oh, well, it, it makes people box it in as something specific. But I think, yeah, it's, it's more, I like to see it as more a mindset and you can be entrepreneurial within a job. Um, more, and, and again we may come to that but then that's exactly how we've set up our organization you know we've moved away from traditional hierarchies and, I'm, and i know we might talk about that um, a little bit later but the idea being is that you could put a business case and it's all about the value exchange and you can set your own parameters kpis it's what you're passionate about and where you could add value and then you can articulate that in your business case and then that's how you either increase your grade or um, get a title promotion within our organization definitely yeah i'm sure we'll come back more to that when we uh when we go to jellyfish but yeah carry on from uh from so, the early days yeah, so, so i came back to the uk when i was 14 and uh went straight into st Bede's school in in red hill in surrey um which was a real culture shock for me um it's uh i could tell you i have so many stories as you can imagine 
um, even down to my accent. I had the strongest Trinidad accent, you know, coming straight into a suburban Surrey state school. Um, yeah, it was really, really an interesting um, experience. And uh, what was really strange for me is that they, they, they got to these points where I didn't really know where I belonged because I came to England. Obviously, I was treated differently because I had the accident. Um, obviously, within Surrey at that time, there wasn't many people of color within the school, etc. So I definitely stood out and was very different. But how quickly I lost my accent and I conformed in my environment and started to pick up some of the uh, either the habits or the vernacular or, or whatever to become more English in my nature. I still was treated differently here in England, but then I started going back to Trinidad and then I was 16, I went back to Trinidad and then they treated me like I was right. um, a foreigner. And then I suddenly thought, well, hang on a sec. Well, so where, where do I belong? Where, where is home for me? And I suddenly started to, to, to understand that um, you've got to make your own belonging. You've, you've got to work towards what's important to you and uh, yeah, so that totally changed my perspective and I had to work really hard to figure out what I wanted and where I felt I should or could belong and, um, and then just start working towards goals to getting there. And so um, anyway, I, I uh, grew up uh, in Surrey. I lived in Hawley and I grew up in, in, in Surrey and went to school. And uh, probably one of the big pivotal moments was uh, did my A-levels, I stayed at St. Peter to do my A-levels, wanting to know what, which universities to go on to. Um, my sister was very academic. She went to King's College, got a first in pharma pharmaceutical pharmacology and research. And then she went on to do a PhD in Cambridge. So she was setting the bar pretty high. And uh, I thought, okay, I wanted to, to do computer studies. I was very interested in computer studies, but I was also very creative. So I did um, technical drawing and graphics, art, physics for my A-levels. And then I applied to IBM to do a computer studies degree sponsored by IBM. It was kind of like one of these part apprentice programs where you got your degree, but you also um, had a guaranteed job at the end of it. And it was a very highly sought after course and uh, degree. Obviously, you were paid to do it each, each year. And uh, so I applied. It was like a very long, arduous application process. I applied. You'll be happy to know I got, I got accepted to go to the two-day um, session, which was uh, all around. It was like a really aggressive episode of The Apprentice. And uh, we had all of these really clever people um, and we did group sessions, aptitude tests, lateral thinking, role playing, interviews. It was ridiculously intense. And uh, you'd be happy to know I was successful. So I got the letter and I've been accepted. I've completely changed because um, probably the bit I didn't mention is that the reason I came back to England, uh, my parents split up and I came to England with my mum, didn't have a lot of money didn't really see, um, saw that a lot of investment and support went into my sister going through her education. And um, so, yeah, I just thought this was it. You know, it's going to be funded, computer studies degree, guaranteed job at IBM. I've made it. I told all my friends, all my family. It's brilliant. Of course, you can imagine there's a catch because, uh, well, without knowing my path, you may not know, but there is a catch. Of course, I didn't read the small print, which was pending my A-level results. Yeah. And I did extremely well in all of my mocks, etc. But then I got an E in physics. Basically, I practically failed physics. Um, don't know why, don't know how. And uh, yeah, so because it's such a sought after course and uh, they said they retracted the offer. So I had to tell everybody, oh my God, you know, I've now... I've blown it, it's my first big failure. I can't believe I've told everyone, assumed I was gonna get in. And then I had to reassess. So I thought, oh, well, what am I gonna do now? So I thought I'll take a year out and uh, I'll make a decision, maybe go to Ravensbourne and do computer graphics, etc. So I had to go through all the application 
talk about all my eggs in one basket. I absolutely assumed that was the route I was going to go. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I walked, I lived in Hawley. I walked into the, the Gatwick Airport and said, I'll take a job for a year. And so um, went to Sunglass Hut and uh, got, I, I pretty much went, asked, have you got any jobs going? And they said, yeah, yeah, you know, oh, we've got a couple of uh, jobs. Uh, do you want an interview now? And I'm like, well, I've been through the two day interview from hell. So there's no way I can't nail this. But I said, yeah, bring it on. Had the interview, got the job. And if I'm going to cut a really long story short, I didn't leave Sunglass Hut for seven years. And um, again, could tell a number of stories as to the journey I went on, but this whole entrepreneurial spirit of constantly overcoming the challenges, getting people on board, having a motivated team to, and getting the best out of them is, uh, you've frozen. I don't know whether I did at the same uh, time. Very briefly, but I think it's fine. I think it's okay, fine. Okay, so yeah. we'll keep going. And uh, yeah, so, um, there were lots of things that I did along the way, but eventually became the head, the, the, the head of all 200 and something European stores uh, from a sales and operations standpoint. Uh, I, at one point, I took my Gatwick store to be the number one turnover store in the world, got called over to Miami to the, to the headquarters to explain all of the things that I was doing in the store um, because it was uh, serious compound growth was being achieved in that environment. And um, yeah, and, and so uh, after that, I went and worked for an entrepreneur for three years because uh, the reason I left Sunglass Hut was the president of Sunglass Hut moved to another company um, called Sanity, which bought our price here in the UK. And, uh, but then I moved over to them with the aim of being the managing director of the European division, but could quickly see that that was not really the, the right move. Then I went and worked for an entrepreneur in Southampton. And that's where I then, his name was Martin Mansbridge. He owned a company called Bike It. And uh, also he owned a chain of mobile phone accessory stores. And so that's why he wanted me with the retail experience for small square footage stores. But ultimately that's where I really learned the cutting edge. And I don't think he would mind me saying, but yeah, uh, yeah I went from the corporate sunglass hut world sure. to yeah, yeah. The, what he called himself. I mean, he was a multimillionaire, very successful businessman. And he just said, I'm a market trader at heart. So there was a lot of the ducking and diving and the really raw parts of business and owning the P&L, et cetera, that I learned from him. And then that's when the, the Sunglass Hut opportunity presented itself because it was around that time when you were, I was what, 30 at the time, just starting to go on stag do's, we're all getting married. And yeah. so stag do's and weddings, and you know, you've got your core group of friends, but then you start widening your network because you keep going on these weekends. Yeah, uh, bumping into a guy, um, an old friend. You know, we, we've got, funnily enough, now retrospectively, we look at, at there's lots of pictures of us together in different parties, etc. But never really hung out as a core group of friends. But during these stag do's, we started talking about business. He had an IT consultancy here in Rygate um, and started. Uh, with pay-per-click and being quite successful on the digital marketing side um, and he kept we kept talking about it and he said from a sales account management business infrastructure he kept saying you know come join come join i was believing my own hype you know no, I, I manage hundreds of people you've got this tiny little consultancy in rygate oh no you, you, this, this would never work but eventually he got to one of those stag do's and we'd had enough conversations i can see his passion um, for the opportunity and uh, he just said come join you know we, we can we can partner and take it forward and uh, one of these stag do's it just happened to be the pair of us that was getting the train from Red Hill to London and we had had no one else with us essentially by the end of that train journey I told him I'm going to go quit my job I'll join you and we'll take this forward and so we rebranded his company Avondale IT to Jellyfish we got rid of all the IT consultancy and network support clients, concentrated only on the digital marketing, and uh, that's how we created Jellyfish. Awesome. That was a yeah, awesome story. And I just want to, um, I kind of want to backtrack a little bit because there's a lot of points there that I kind of want to dive into and, and just sure. kinda, like press you on. So kind of going right back to the, um, to sort of the school days and then 
you know, the IBM grad scheme and that being, you know, up in lights is, you know, your fast track to success. So I just wanted to ask, like, were you, uh, were you a high achiever at school? Like, and then was that obviously the IBM at the time for you seemed like, you know, the, the most amazing opportunity. You felt like if you didn't get that, you probably saw yourself as more of a failure. Um, it, it reminds me of a, an experience I had coming out of university, kind of got these good grades and you know thought I was very much entitled to one of the best grad schemes going and um, <clears throat> I got to the end of uh, um, a the Heinz grad scheme so a similar sort of apprentice style um, day to, to what you had um, and I was like you know this is it this is my route to you know big money every year um, I've got to get this like I've, you know the family will be so happy when I get this and, and all that kind of thing uh, and I remember you know preparing for it for ages and then getting there on the day um we had a couple of couple of interviews in the morning thought it had gone okay like been fairly honest and then they just kind of sat us sat half of us down at lunchtime and said if you're in the room please leave you haven't been successful enough <laughs> and that was it brutal. yeah yeah pretty brutal and and it was what well, it was interesting because at the time it felt like it was such a bad moment and that my life was going to be so much worse off because of that. But sort of looking back four years on or five years on or wherever it is, it's like probably one of the best things that kind of could have happened to me because it allowed me to go down another route. And it sounds like there's a lot of kind of overlap with, with that kind of experience that you had there. So yeah, so I was just wondering, like, were you a high, like a high achiever at school and did you really see yourself going down that route? And now retrospectively, do you see how, it, it was like happened for a reason or like how, how do you sort of look at that now in retrospect? Yeah, I, I wasn't a high achiever, no. I think my main issue and my geeky analogy that I use is that if, if, I, were, if I were a computer, I think my processing chip is okay. Right. My hard drive has no capacity. I'm, I constantly, I feel like I have to dump information to take any more in, but okay. problem solving, Got it. I, I love. So, so it, sort it's of more, remembering, you know, the textbooks, that wasn't your, your forte. Wasn't my thing. And I, I, I found it very challenging to read a whole book even. You right. know, I'd get to the end of the page and my mind drifted and I've, I've worked out another challenge that was just one thing somebody said in the book that triggered another thought. And then I come back and go, oh, where did I? Oh, so I read again and I just get, I just get so frustrated. And um, so the knowledge, so the difference between sort of intelligence and knowledge was sure. becoming more and more evident to me. And uh, I, I put more emphasis in trying to work things out. And that, that's led to a lot of my approach that I don't always use things that have worked in the past or um, I try to keep very objective I, I i will be informed and i ask and i do it very verbally and through dialogue and and uh, um it's people that i trust and respect that i go to for advice all the time and put it in the melting pot but ultimately i always want to use the information to come up with the best solution so i go back and in the school days and the education system doesn't lend doesn't put a lot of weight and emphasis on that side sure it may be maths, a bit of physics, which is the ir ir irony, but it's still a lot of learning and studying. And the more time and effort you put in, the, the reward, the more you get out. And I think that people who remember and can systematically go through the questions and do lots of rehearsals and, and, and past papers are successful. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be wor the world's problem solvers. So I wasn't really didn't do i did well i did okay um but um certainly was not a high achiever i've kind of found that as time's gone on the ability to to within work and the way in which i interact with people it, that's more where my superpowers lie and that's led to more success than would have been uh highlighted or um identified through the school days yeah so were you were you aware of that at the time like were you aware like i don't think school's kind of getting the best out of how i can you know better bet myself in the future or is that something that you've kind of seen in ret retrospect like I, I find yeah it's very interesting that you talk about that 
as, as a successful entrepreneur about school and yet something that, that I've thought about a lot is so would you even say that it's kind of almost anti what some of the some of the traits that you want as a, as a successful entrepreneur as a problem solver actually doing well in tests is almost anti what you need to be to be a good problem solver possibly or i just think it needs to happen in parallel i just think it needs to be identified more yeah. and, a, and a track you can take through your schooling and it's all very it feels um prescribed and it's deep in tradition of how you're supposed to assess people yeah and there's not been much evolution and you think about it how much evolution has there been uh, with all the technology all of the flexibility we've been asked there's been so much has happened through the COVID period, you know, where they say we've had three years or 10 years of progress in the space of six months. And you think what they've had to do with schooling and the way in which they're assessing individuals and how they're going to be grading um, all of the students. I think it has to be a catalyst to some form of change because it has just been the same. And I don't think the world is the same. And I, just, and I think there are better ways to, to identify. And schooling was almost, just to put you in a category, it was, it was back in the days where uh, most people were factory workers or they worked in a specific trade. Yeah. And uh, I, I, yeah, I just think things are, are very different now. And I would do things differently if I could start from scratch with educating our yeah. next generation. I'd probably do things differently. For sure. I mean, it's one of those things where I can't remember where it was, but quite recently I just saw someone who was you know, 16, 17 and they, and they were taking a biology paper and I just looked at it and I thought, I just can't help, like, you know, this paper printed out, they're looking at those little diagrams and it's you know, exactly the same as what I was doing eight, 10 years ago. Right. And exactly the same as what they were doing 20, 30 years ago, pretty much. Right. And I was thinking, the world is so different now to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Like, how can that still be the same process of education that, that you're going through? Um, but as you say, and I think this will be a theme that constantly comes up, it's that tradition versus innovation. And that tradition is so strong and it's just, you know, being kept going and to actually just, you know, start again or to completely change is, is a very difficult thing to do. Um, yeah, because I mean, every, every induction, and then to reinforce that point within Jellyfish, we constantly ask people to challenge the norm and to be innovative. You know, we use any of the analogies that are out there. We use the um, don't, don't spend your time too busy chopping the wood to sharpen the ax. Stop, reconsider, take some time, test, analyze, refine, just constantly challenge the norm and the process and, and so that we could keep evolving. And, yeah. uh, and, and I, I start every induction with the, the, the five monkeys story, which is, a, which is a, an old story. And it's basically five monkeys in a cage with some steps and some bananas. And, and essentially you've got a, a, fire, a fire engine with freezing cold pressurized water. And uh, this doesn't really happen, by the way. So no animal cruelty, because I, I always get people that look at me like in horror. They get it's not real. Yeah, and then, and then basically any of the monkeys go for the bananas and you hose them all down with this freezing cold pressurized water and then you do it a couple of times and obviously they shake and they don't do it anymore. You take a new monkey, put it in the cage and what happens, obviously that monkey looks at the steps and the bananas, looks at the others and goes, you idiots, why aren't you going for the bananas? Starts going, the other, they're petrified, they put them down, give them a bit of a shake, he tries again, another shake. And then what hands you, you end up taking one of the original four, put a new one in, the original three, still petrified. Yeah. Um, no one's been hosed down again, by the way. That's an important part of the story. You've wound up the hose, put it in the engine, it's gone. That's never to be seen again. Yet, all the monkeys are acting in a certain way. So they then end up swapping out all of the monkeys. And what ends up happening is that the five monkeys are there, steps, bananas, and if they could talk and you ask them, well, why none of you going for the bananas? They look at each other, not a single one of them have been hosed down, and they just say, well, that's the way we do it. And, there, and, and I say that because there are so many times where somebody would ask us, why do we do things in a certain way? And I would just say to them, that's probably a five monkeys. That's something that we didn't take the time to sit, reassess, 
is this the best way? Is there now technology? Is there knowledge that we've now got? Has somebody come with experience of doing it a different way into our organization? Don't ever think that the organization is bigger than you. Everybody contributes at a level that can add value and you can affect huge change globally if you introduce these. And then that's where your business case comes in and people don't feel boxed in and told, step in line, you know, stay where the hierarchy suggests you should be. Everybody can have a global impact and add value. So that's what we, we try to nurture within the organization. So it's almost this constant process of mindfulness almost to be, to, to, to like not get, you know, ahead of yourself and just like, that's it now. And we don't have to think about that again because it's, it's, we've solved it type thing. It's like constantly going back to it and being conscious of it and going and continuing to ask that question. Can it be better? Um, and, 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 and I want to, people to be specifically rewarded for that. You know, there's a lot of organizations you're, deemed as a troublemaker yeah. or non-compliant but we've got yeah. to make sure that you're you're specifically incentivized to add value and and to challenge the norm because i was going to ask about that as well and, and relating to the monkey thing is the, the big thing that i was going to bring up is that kind of the fear and the ego of you know those other monkeys trying to pull the monkey down to get the banana and yes they're sort of trying to protect them but also there's that sense of like i don't want you to have the bananas that i could get so is, is there that sense of... There is a lot of that. And I think that, yeah. And, and that ego problem? Well, I, I, I think there's ego, but there's, there's also, you know, one of our primary instincts is self-preservation, you know, and, and that comes from, from life inherently, you know, you, we, we preserve our life. But also some people think their livelihood is directly correlated with their life. And when, you, when, you, when you, you, your livelihood feels like it's being threatened, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think your inherent human nature kicks in and yeah. you start trying to suppress others around you to elevate yourself and to keep yourself where you are. <laughs> so trying to eradicate that is difficult. So the only way you can do it is build an infrastructure that allows other people to succeed and it doesn't compromise you or put your livelihood in jeopardy. And in actual fact, if part of your value add could be identifying and supporting people to fast track through the business, that's an important thing too. Sure. And so how does that, how does that sort of jumping ahead a little bit here, but how does that look and like a practical level? Does it, I mean, it, it sounds like that it wouldn't be very hierarchical in terms of normally you'd have to, you know, jump through the hoops and get your promotion, but if someone is showing that they're, they're, they're showing innovation and they're being um, given that meritocracy, how does that work? Can someone therefore jump way ahead of someone else if they're yeah. doing better? So, so where the pyramids were, yeah, yeah. So the, the pyramids were there. We don't have any heads of. So for example, we've got the, the grading system and we've got the, the, the career stages. So you can go executive manager, senior manager, director, senior director, VP, executive VP, um, chief solutions officer, and so on. So you've got all of those stages, but you've also got grades because the other thing is that you don't want to have to change your job role in order to progress. Right. So the grading right. system is there working in parallel that if you were, for example, um, a, a paid search specialist and you just love being a paid search specialist, if you keep adding value, you can keep putting these business cases through sure. for the value exchange, but you don't have to change your title. You could just be better and better. So as an example, if you had the biggest PPC paid search blog in the world and was getting loads of traction and you were associated with Jellyfish and we got leads and we were deemed as a, as a thought leader off the back of all of your work, then that's a value exchange that you could be remunerated more for because I think that's fair. You could be, um, for example, you could be doing TED Talks. You could be um, training people. You could just be a motivator. You, you, know, you could be the mentor to a bunch of people. There's, there's so many things you could do without changing your job role. The problem we had is that, again, like traditional um, organizations, historically it was all about the number of people that you manage. And uh, we ended up having all of these layers of people in management and all of these different weird and wonderful titles to cater for an old system. 
Yeah. And, uh, and it wasn't. I mean, our people, it's a very specific skill. It's a very different superpower to be able to motivate, drive, manage individuals. So it's not that you, you know, necessarily, um, and, and actually it takes you away from doing the, the value that you've added over the time. So um, we changed it. So you've got the grading system where you could just keep going up in grades based on the value exchange. And then the, with the titles, they're career stages, but there is no head of. So we changed it so that you don't necessarily have line managers. You've got a support network. We're trying to change it that you treat your career like a hobby. You know, what, why, do, why do you find time in our busy schedules to actually um, have a hobby? Why? Because you enjoy it. You're passionate about it. You often, you want to improve, you know, if you're doing something on a regular basis, you find your own measures to what success looks like and you find ways to measure, measure your performance against those targets. Um, you find the time, you're often, it's a community of like-minded people that you, um, that contribute to your progression and you enjoy engaging with them. Uh, and there are so many parallels to, if you could just take that mindset and that enjoyment and passion and progression and put it into your career, I think you'll be a lot happier and add a lot more value. And when you think about it, when it comes to a hobby, you're not reliant on somebody driving you. You don't have somebody telling you exactly what to do or getting you out of bed to, to every day or measuring your timekeeping and all of that, that those um, type of uh, measurements. You just do it because you love it, you're passionate about it, and you still seek help. You may have a mentor, you could have a, a, a psych psychologist to help you get better, you could have a, a, a physical coach to get you better, you can look at YouTube videos, you can read books, you can ask other people, you can observe. There are so many ways we improve with our hobbies, and why are we self-motivated to do that and own it for ourselves? That's what the difference is. So you create an environment where your progression is down to you. You can leverage all of the help you need. You've got a specific support network, but you could, you could use anybody in the organization. And then you're valued. And, you can, and once those measures are put in place and you've got clear KPIs for what success looks like, you don't, you don't need a line manager telling you you've achieved them. It's black or white. Yeah. We're even thinking in order to, to ensure that it's completely fair and agnostic, these business cases, because it's so tangible, we don't even need to put a name to it. But we, we, we could literally submit a business case, you could look at all the information involved and go, yeah, that person deserves a great increase, no doubt about it. You don't even know who they are. Yeah. So it gets rid of all of that subjectivity and people suppressing others and worrying about treading on toes. And so you can just keep going. Sheer value, sheer value exchange. Sheer value exchange. That's it. That's it. I, I say to everybody. I mean, yeah, I, I I love the fact that you want to be here, and I I really our community and our people, and I just love everything about it. But ultimately, this is a a business value exchange at the core, and if you add more value, you should be paid more. You should progress, and um and once we keep it. And, and that for me right there is you've summed up that entrepreneurial mindset whilst being in a job. It's that taking the, the self motivation standpoint. And mm -hmm. it's all about. But I, I wanted to highlight a specific example there that you mentioned about, for example, uh, someone in paid search having a blog on the side, which, and just to, just to clarify, you mean it could potentially be, you know, a blog under their personal brand rather than jellyfish's brand. Yeah. Like, for an example like that is a lot of traditional companies would almost see that as a threat. They'd see it as well, you're trying to get work and you should get all the work underneath our house and don't, you know, don't say too much on your social media and, and this kind of mindset. But it's amazing to hear you have almost the opposite mindset to that. So I was going to ask that, like, why do you think a lot of companies don't have that mindset and why does maybe the more traditional structure not fit into that kind of self empowerment and, you know, adding value in, in all out, out, out of the box kind of ways. Yeah, I, I think we, we, we go back to like what Branson famously said about uh, um, his teams. And he says, train and, development, train and develop them so they can leave, 
but treat them so that they in a way that they would want to stay you know all of this anything suppressing anybody thinking that's what's going to keep them in your environment and get the best out of them i think that's a, a, a core uh, mistake i mean that, that's something that i'm not interested in what i say to everybody is that create your own brands i would i think it's much better than to have jellyfish as the brand and say oh look at all these people mm. than to have a thousand recognized brands and then they find out they're all associated to jellyfish it's more that way around i want supreme brilliant people who have no constraint and can go out there and share and be thought leaders and and uh um, get that exposure and i just want everybody to go that is a brilliant person oh again <laughs> jellyfish associated with jellyfish that's a brilliant person associated with jellyfish i can't every time they keep coming up and whether that's to start with or even in their in their history that's what i want i just i just want to be able to enable people to be the best they could be to be their best selves and to enjoy and be passionate at work and then we as a collective community benefit from that amazing yeah really really cool um yeah, so I, again, I wanted to just backtrack to keep to, to bring up a few things that I really want to talk about. So, um, yeah, so you, you've kind of gone through this um, IBM setback, which I'm sure looking back on, was you're probably glad it happened. So, talk to me a little bit more in depth about the Sunglass Hut experience and when you joined there. Was it this quite traditional business that you saw loads of opportunities to change? Was that was that difficult to implement those changes? Um, so, yeah, talk to me about some of the um, some of the challenges that you faced there and some of practically what you actually did that was innovative to, to take the business to, to new levels. So it was, it was an amazing uh, business from a development standpoint, but most importantly, the autonomy that you end up having. So at a very young age, you're responsible for the store p &L, all of the inventory, the quality of the members of staff, recruitment, um, performance management, cashing up, merchandising, you know, it, it literally, you had this small business unit and at 20 years old, you're, you've got the full accountability to run it. And, uh, and so I learned a lot. And if you have the right mindset that you want to overcome, you embrace those challenges and you want to overcome um, all of the, whatever constraints you feel there are within your environment, if, you'll always stay positive and want to be the solution. It's a great place to be and everything. So, so many things that I did then now are in, um, in, in the processes and, and the approach that we have at Jellyfish today from the interviewing. I remember interviewing people and thinking, well, this is just a stop gap for most people. Then, you know, they, they like me, they've just come in because they don't quite know what to do. No one thinks I'm going to go into retail that's going to be my career path. But also, it's often their first jobs. Who in their right mind is going to think that they're going to identify the best people by having a, 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 an interview process and uh, um, a, a, an engagement that where they're completely nervous, that they don't know what's coming next, uh, they don't know what the expectations are from that meeting. They haven't got the experience of being through interviews, et cetera. How are you going to find your gems? And uh, funnily enough, one person that, if, if you ask them, talks about the interview process, and that's Ramesh Ranganathan. He was, I actually interviewed him really? to come and work in Sunglass Hut. He's from Crawley near Gatwick Airport, and he was actually one of uh, my team members in, in one of the stores and he talks about the interview um, process which is quite amusing but um, one of the things that I identified really quickly is that you've got to make people feel comfortable like a real work environment to get the best out of them and started devising this methodology where I give the person all of the questions I'm going to ask it's written down give them a pen bullet point and say you've got 15 minutes think about it bullet point i'm not going to take this off you this is just your own cheat sheet but you're going to know exactly what i'm going to ask you and i'll come back in 15 minutes and then just instantly not having the anticipation of what 
that that question is going to catch you out or what I want from you and giving you time to think because in most scenarios in a work environment you don't have to answer straight away in a quick fire pressurized environment so that was one of the things that I learned early on so I started doing that at Sunglass Hut but I think it's more about the, the problem solving and uh, and also observing things that happen around you and applying that to your own environment. It doesn't have to be your idea. It's the application of great ideas or great initiatives that you could bring to your own organization. In, in that case, um, a, a small story would be, I was walking past Bally, the shoe shop, and uh, the manageress, she was like pulling down all the shoes. I'm like, oh no, are you guys shutting down? And she said, no, 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 we just had the Lagos flight. So we're taking down all of the size sevens. We've now got the Jap we now got the uh, Tokyo flight. So we're putting up size threes. And it's only because they have a very short window. The demographic completely changes within three minutes. And they want people to go around and just try on the shoes quickly. They don't have time to go back and forth. So they're changing. And I'm like, oh, that is so obvious. And I go, I literally skip back to the store, big huddle, right, <clears throat> we're going to change the front of the store, I'm going to change everything for each flight. And instead of standing there mindlessly cleaning lenses, we all had a purpose. Yeah. And, it was, and it was exciting because we were thinking, I was like, you get the flight schedule, you work out what demographic are going to like, what type of sunglasses, you get all the POS materials so we can get the right posters to appeal to the right demographic. Next minute, we're doing that and we're sort of re-merchandising the store between, um, it's like a military operation. And then I start coming in and in the back room, I've seen they've done a deal with WH Smith and they're getting like all the local Vogue's and they're actually doing research on what type of glasses are trendy in what markets at the time. We're ordering different POS from the global Sunglass Hut team and everybody, and, and they're all thinking, what's going on in this store? We're start, they're starting to see that we're doing things differently just from what we order, how we order, the type of glasses. And then what ended up happening? Well, yeah, of course. The, the US flight comes through, it's Maui Jim's Oakley's and Ray-Bans. The, the uh, Italian flights go through, it's Giorgio Armani and Chloe and then the Yakimoto for the, uh, for the Japanese flights and it's Cartier and Versace for the Lagos flights. And we are literally changing the store and you could physically see, you could see them, you know, their trolleys and they're looking over and they're like drawn to the shop and they, it was brilliant. Yeah. But that was just the start of it. Because of course, when you get four times the number of people across the lease line, we've only got so much space in the store. So you can only store so many sunglasses. And so we started running out. We kept running out of sunglasses and we didn't have time in that one hour to go to the remote stock room. And so most would say, well, there's nothing you could do about that because you've got a physical amount of space, nothing we could do. <clears throat> we thought, no, there is something you could do. We, it's because it's a bit like that scenario. You know, when you go to the shoe, shoe shop and, and uh, you love a pair of shoes, do they have your size? Yeah. And, you, you know, and then you're like, oh, they don't have your size. You know the store manager's going, oh, I could sell so many more shoes if everybody was a size nine. Yeah. Then I can just have all size nines. I can't run out. Yeah. Take that concept. Why don't we just get everybody to buy a select few of styles, but we could just stock them deep. So what we did is we, the ones in the posters, the ones we knew were the best sellers, etc. we put an eye level all around the store. And then all the others were just to give the perception of choice. Right. But we knew which ones we were going to buy. And so instead of having three of each style, we had 25 of the styles that we knew we were going to sell. And yeah. so all the staff knew which ones to sell. We put them at eye level and that way we weren't running out anymore. So now we've got a scenario where we've got four times the number of people coming across the lease line and we are not running out. So exponentially, you can start to see the difference that that makes straight away. And then the list goes on. The, 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 they used to come in boxes with a case. And, yeah. But all the cases were the same. Right. So we had a certain amount of storage. So you had 20 boxes with cases and glasses, but you, it's always going to be the same case. So what we started doing 
is when we got our deliveries in, we took out all the cases and then we could put three or four pairs in the box. And we just had to have, as an example, we just had to have 30 cases. It didn't, know, it didn't matter which style somebody took, we, had, we, we, we would just use the, the same generic case. And so again, we increased the capacity of the store. The only reason I'm telling these stories is because it went this 300 square foot store, we totally transformed the capacity and the amount they could sell. And what they saw was they saw a store that, that was quadrupling its turnover in a multi-million environment. And so that's what turned heads. They were like, what is going on in the store? They asked the managing director of Europe, this is when I was you know, obviously young and, and the store manager, they asked the managing director, can, can he explain which new flight, which new airline's gone into North Terminal Gatwick? What's, what's changed? What, what macro change has happened? And they looked at it and I said, nothing. The only thing we can see, the only variable we can see is this young fellow called Rob Pierce gone in and uh, he's the manager of the store. And so I get a phone call from the president of, in Miami and he's like, come over and tell us what you've been doing. We're interested. Like, and how old were you at this time? 20, somewhere else. 20. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so you, you went over to Miami and how did, that, how did that go? Well, I just basically told them what we were doing and it just, and they said, I want you to do more of that. So I, I, you know, I, I looked after all the airports, that, well, all in Gatwick, then all in Heathrow and Gatwick, then all the airports, then south of England, then the UK, then Europe. And so it just progressively, they just wanted to see more of that. And, it, and, it's, and um, they're just small examples of the many ways in which we just kept changing. We, we had fun with people, you know, we, the, the way in which we did our sales training, KPIs. It's all about measurement. You don't have to ask somebody to change their behavior if there's visible measurement. Like we go back to the passion and owning your own career. Yeah. If I said, if I listed the 20 people that worked in our store and I had each KPI, so for example, number of units per transaction, average transaction value, accessories percentage, um, I, I had about five or six of them and I just ranked you for each KPI, ranked you one to 20. Yeah. And then added it up and basically the top three get lunch, get their McDonald's or whatever. Um, and the bottom three, we used to have these challenges. So, for example, um, we, our store opened at five in the morning, closed at 11 at night or 12 at night, something like that. So on the three month run up to New Year's Day, the bottom two in the KPI table did the five o'clock shift on New Year's Day. Okay. And so the entire store were yeah. just looking at these, measuring them, incentivized to, um, to do better. And uh, you, just, you just created a culture. <laughs> what ended up happening is that our attrition was less because um, people, people wanted to see it through almost. You, you, when you had those targets or we were re-merchandising the store, people wanted to know what the outcome of that was. It, it just, I could tell you so many stories. I mean, we, that we started realizing that when you re-merchandise the front of the store, we started looking at people's behavior and some people and some flights walked in and when we merchandised the front, went right around the store. And then some went left. And we started looking at it and then when we did the analysis, it was all of the Commonwealth countries, the UK, Commonwealth countries, etc., were going left. And then, of course, it was the U.S., continental Europe, were going right. Yeah. And that's the way we drive. Obviously, it's the way you approach a roundabout, your natural instinct. And I think that's why if, if you were to walk down somewhere in the U.S. and you're walking towards people, you try to get out the way on the left. They try to get out the way to the right, and you start doing that little shuffle. But um, we, we were observing that, so we started merchandising the store according to the flight so that it carries on in the right direction. So it was just... I'm just watching, and it's not all my ideas. So once you start, it becomes trendy in your environment to problem solve and to come up with these ideas and you're revered and, and, and rewarded and, and recognized for it. It just becomes self-perpetuating. Yeah. No, the, the, the big thing that uh, hits me when you talk about these stories and the big thing I want to ask is, I suppose it's, it's quite rare for a 20-year-old to have that 
just that passion and that drive and that um, coming from a place of self um, self motivation. And I was just what, like, can you pinpoint why you have that? And say if you had got the IBM grad scheme and you'd done it that way, do you think you would have had that same willingness to question and willingness to drive? Like, where where would you say that? that willingness to go, no, I, I can do this better and not just look at the people above you and go, I'll just do it like them because, you know, I, I, they're on a pedestal and that's how I should do it. And what made yeah. you really want to question? Or is it just something you've always done? It's always done. It's, it's, it's fun. It's, yeah. it's, the, it's the whole problem solve and, and looking at something and just going, it's, it's got to be a way. And it just, it becomes habitual. You know, it just, I don't know. I don't know where, where exactly it started. But but it, try right? From the, from the gold, exactly, exactly, exactly. I, I, I just don't know, and it's it's definitely a core trait, and then you know, and it's it's instilled in people that that's our core values at Jellyfish, and um, yeah. obviously it's better if it's natural and instinctive. Yeah. But like I said, it's I think it's more habitual. I think what ends up happening is that if everyone around you is doing it, and everybody has a different experience, and and everybody has a different um, unique way of thinking and that's where you, you, you know it's becoming trendy to say that you should have a cultural and cognitive diversity in your workforce yeah. but it's not just a trend it is a fact that the more you've got people but it's got to all be within an infrastructure where you can be heard mm. it's genuinely listened to and if you can prove it adds value so we're constantly coming up with ideas and you try to to disprove the hypothesis at first and if you can't disprove it, you try it. And if, you, and if it works, you roll it out. And so there's lots of minimal viable products, lots of starting something, giving it a chance. More is lost from indecision than wrong decisions. I think that it, you know, when opportunities pass you by, they're gone. But if you, if you mitigate your risk and go into something and try it, then you could always retract or pivot. And I think one thing I ask everybody at Jellyfish, and this, this, it's one of those situations where everything has to be, everything has to work for any of it to work. So part of it with this type of environment is that you've got to say to people, afford me the ability to always make a current decision. And this is where the, 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 this is where the conversation about the tradition versus yeah, um, yeah. How, we, how we disrupt and innovate is you could still decide to do it the same way, but make it a decision to do it the same way. Make, make sure you've thought about it. You're not just doing it because it's a tradition or because sense a check, make sure there's not a better way to do it. Is it still relevant? And if it is, but don't ever, if I'm in a meeting, I urge people, don't say, but Rob, you said this last month. Because I, I may not have had a conversation with you. I may not have read a book. I may not, I may not have discovered this technology. It, the, the world might not have been in a pandemic. You know, it's like, there yeah. are so many ways in which you have to keep reassessing and making your decision current. Sure. And so that's one of the things that, that is instilled in everyone here at Jellyfish too. Yeah. And I think um, it's a good time to bring it up, I think, is what I wanted to ask, just jumping ahead slightly. Obviously, you now work for, at, through the vehicle of Jellyfish for, you know, hundreds of different brands, companies across multiple different industries and is it the same mindset that applies to them and their their business i mean i'm sure it i'm sure it is but it's how do you see this kind of uh, manifesting itself across different industries and obviously one of which is is golf that i have like an, an active interest where that mindset of questioning making current decisions constantly and not just doing it because of tradition blindly is that something that you apply to all industries and have you seen how that can be beneficial? Well, well, we apply it, but it's difficult because again, when you're in a true partnership, you need both parts of the partnership to have a similar yeah. mindset and, and process. So we, we, we apply it to everything that we do, but I think there are definite challenges in large organizations where they've got that infrastructure. It is still, quite uh, um, the, the legacy pyramid structures and hierarchies are in place. I think it could be quite political. It's not a meritocracy at, at all. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, there are traditions. And um, 
it's about status. It's about who, was it your idea? Was it your campaign? Was it your, it's, uh, um, yeah. So I, I do think it's a challenge. And how, how do you battle with that? It must, must be a big challenge for a company like Jellyfish. Like, how, how, do you, how do you get through that barrier of tradition and try and foster that innovative mindset? I think the first thing is to get ours right. So at the moment, it's, we are the big proof of concept. You know, 1,100 plus people across all of our markets. And if we, if we get it right, and then we sort of have a white paper or um, a presentation on the, 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 the merits of the way in which we are approaching it and the tangible evidence that it is successful. We have lots of metrics that suggest it is definitely uh, moving in the right direction. Um, our attrition for all of our key players is ridiculously low. That's because we haven't got that challenge where, you know, our senior leadership, the 15 that are my support network, the ones I go to, no one's ever left. So if you get into um, the, the senior leadership, you can constantly see the, the benefits and you're rewarded and recognized. We have got no attrition. Now, what is a real plus in my mind could also be perceived as a massive negative because all of your ambitious next layer are looking at what in a traditional hierarchy system, their seniors are going nowhere. So they're going to have to go elsewhere to find the next step, more progression, et cetera. But the way we've set up has allowed them and they can see a clear path, which is in their hands to keep adding value. So I think we just need to get it right, be able to demonstrate, show those metrics and all the, the success that we're achieving through this methodology. And then, it goes a little against what I was saying about you know, looking elsewhere to try and solve your problems, but I still think use cases to put into the melting pot is a good thing. And if we could help our clients start to uh, mirror a similar infrastructure, then I think we could work better at partners. I'm at this point by no means saying that we've got it all cracked and that anybody, everybody should follow what Jellyfish does. I'm just trying to go back to the spirit of solving the genuine problems that we've got as an organization and putting in new and innovative structures and measures to overcome those the, those specific challenges and if that inspires anybody else to possibly go in a similar direction etc then that's great because as i demonstrated with the the bally shoe store yeah. i don't take claim for everything that's going on but i'm definitely observing what's happening around and it will take all the good bits that i think plugs in nicely to the way that we do things yeah it's, it's a really interesting area it's certainly one that i'm definitely uh, interested for many reasons but let, let's use i wanted to bring up the topic of golf obviously you are a keen golfer yourself um i wanted to bring up the topic of golf because it's, i guess it's a really good example because you look at the sport of golf and it's a very traditional game especially here in the uk you know, there's, everyone knows that the stereotype of golf is, you know, men's only clubs and started in St. Andrews in, you know, 1400s, whatever it is. So it, 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 it breathes tradition. It absolutely smells of tradition. Um, and, and much of the tradition in golf is what makes it great. But then at the same time, it's also got this massive problem of how can we keep the sport relevant to th this day and age? And it's a, there's a lots of problems been talked about by all the leading bodies in the golf world of you know how do we keep it relevant whilst maintaining those traditions that we know and love so i wanted to sort of ask you know what's your standpoint in terms of how does an industry like golf or how would you say an industry like golf does adapt to that change because there's so much of that tradition holding it back is it something that you need to just keep continually working on that tradition and try and tweak it and change it or sometimes do you need a completely separate new start again kind of do these corporations need to more think in that like reinvention start something completely separate to actually make a change and go alongside it where, where do you sort of stand on that's a great that's a great question i think it would it would lose its essence if you you'd have to call it something else if you scrapped and started again so i i definitely think evolution is the way forward I think when you look, I think some golf courses, not just jacket and tie when having dinner, you had to wear a tie whilst playing golf. You know, places where you have to have knee length socks with your shorts 
so there's like a tiny gap like that on your knee where you you're exposed to the sun it's like what what is what what, what is that tradition why was it there and what's it achieving today so it, I, and I think it, is it still relevant is it does it adhere to all of society's views and the progression that we've made um, as, as either a society or community so I think we have to keep looking at how life is changing when you could leisurely play for four or five hours and then get changed and have a dinner that, that those days are, are over and I think there's even even if you go into the the um, the game itself I challenge some of the thought process anyway you, you look at what when you watch golf on television or um, you, you look at the fact that half of it is on the green for example and that's not the exciting part to watch shot making you're putting these golf courses on however many acres of land and you've got all of that that you do before you get to the green yet so much emphasis is on what happens on that small surface area of the green you might as well just have 18 green and have a separate tournament that's just putting <clears throat> so I think it's a shame to have such a big outdoor sport that comes down to this small area. So what your, you know, your company and what you're looking at is a slight, that's with the bigger holes. I think that makes a lot of sense. So that we take a bit less emphasis. So chipping, pitching in, all of the shot making become, gets more emphasis. Mm. And then the hole, I believe, just needs to be bigger. And I also believe that the length of time it takes you know, can we get young people who, who operate differently, the way we live, the, how we travel, et cetera. I think that maybe 18 holes, it doesn't need to be 18 holes. You know, why not 12 holes? And 12 holes is just enough time. I also think that the social nature of it, the reason why sometimes it takes so long is that people just come in, drip feed into the bar, then you, you, conversations happen. Why can't we have everybody together after the tournament. So we should have more shotgun starts. You know, everybody goes up at the same time, we finish at the same time. Then if you don't have all the tradition where you have to go in and change and shirt and tie, if you could just all relax, go in, have a drink, you could do the presentation from the competition. And I just think all of these things together will make it more accessible, uh, you're more likely to be able to play um, just quicker, more appealing, and I don't think it will ruin the essence of the game. So I, I do think there are certain things in life and tradition that I do respect, but I am always questioning, is it relevant to the world today? Yeah. And there are a lot of traditions that obviously still are. There, there's lots of things that you do um, in life that, uh, and, uh, that are still applicable today and just nice. Yeah. To, to, yeah, to have that um, tradition. And I think that's why, why golf is such a great example. So, for example, for me, the four majors, which are, you know, the four m big tournaments throughout the year that the pros play, like, for me, I would never really want to change any of them because yeah. everyone knows I love them. They work, they attract huge crowds, you know, even non-golfers can enjoy watching a major. But it's, you know, it's the thousands of other tournaments that go on that probably need um, looking at in terms of like engagement. But the interesting point, like if, you know, if all of, if everyone was like you or, or I, you know, being saying, right, we're going to quickly just, you know, make the hole bigger in one of these PGA tour events, it would be fine because we'd be like, yeah, we completely get that. But I think the problem is, is you've got probably an older generation who are looking at it and if they heard that they would be completely resistant to it and probably a, a, a body like the PGA Tour or the RNA are so are so entrenched in golf world they've probably grown up as golfers they've you know played lots of golf all these decision makers throughout their life they're not necessarily they hear the, a, a, the solution of like potentially make the hole bigger and it just sounds so out the box and so ridiculous to them that you could change the size of the hole that it almost seems stupid rather than a than a kind of actually practical solution to make yeah. that's that's why i talk about that's why i spoke about before like do you need to potentially just think about it as a kind of not like and I, I completely agree with you on the point of it it's not you're not trying to rip golf down and completely change it and 
I think traditional golf will start keep as traditional golf and the majors will always be pure golf, traditional golf kind of as they are, because that works even to this day. But I think there needs to be a separate, a bit like 2020 cricket and test cricket is there needs to be that kind of separate entity, um, which, which stands as a, as a separate thing and, and actually kind of complements traditional golf and feeds people into that game. So that's what we're trying to do with one part is, yeah, is be ourselves so. as, as a kind of separate separate sport almost that that doesn't that doesn't detract from traditional golf but but adds to it and, and sits as that bridge um so yeah, yeah. I, I'm, and i'm all for that 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 is that is the, the the principle of reassessing and uh overcoming yeah whatever challenges people have with golf today and the appeal of golf etc i think it's uh i think it's great um be interested to to track the progress yeah when, when you know yeah definitely good to put your brains um going forward with it but um yeah one um one other thing i just what i noted down i really wanted to just like talk about a little bit more because it's quite interesting is this this jelly fest um it's obviously the first the first uh impression i had of the company but it, why why a festival like what what is the actual i was actually going to ask another question as well is why jellyfish why the name jellyfish and then why why Jelly Fest and why is that so important for the company? So the jellyfish question is, we at the time had six people and we sat around the table and we said, let's go from A to Z, just say the first word that comes in your mind. And we just went from A to Z and we said, a brand is what a brand does. We don't want it to be, we don't want to get into like a car phone warehouse situation where your brand name, when last did they sell a car phone? You know, it's like, it was one of those things that, um, let's be like Virgin. A brand is what a brand does. It's what it stands for. It's about how it makes you feel, what it, what it represents for um, the, the level of delivery and trust and equity in that brand. So, so we weren't too fucked to call ourselves at the time PPC champions or leap to the top or any reference to what we were doing. So we just keep it reasonably generic. And uh, it was as simple as that. We want to be able to spell it, remember it, and it didn't um, constrain what we do in the future. And that was it. It was no more scientific than that. Paul and I, we went around the list, took it to the pub, had a couple of pints, whichever one felt right, and jellyfish just kept feeling right. And uh, that was <laughs> as scientific as it was. There's, so, there's something really in that. Like, I think how you, you talked about that thought process of sort of not boxing yourself in in the first first decision you make when start a company like if you were to call yourself you know leapfrog to the top or something like you're immediately box yourself into only ever being a se or that's at least how the founders are thinking whereas you obviously pick something that's more like a black canvas it's like let's take this wherever it goes we might become a festival company you never know <laughs> exactly and then as for jelly fed that was again a natural evolution the more people that we had our summer party <laughs> We, really, we, we started having people, maybe a performance, the, the, the food stalls became more to cater for more people. And uh, we always had it in a space that, that had capacity and we just kept growing. And so when you have hundreds of people all getting together for a celebration and, and a party, it just started becoming more and more of a festival. And that's when it got branded Jellyfest. And, uh, and now, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of the signature events. I mean, we obviously always have our Christmas stroke holiday parties as well. But um, yeah, so it's one summer, one uh, Christmas stroke holiday party. But it becomes challenging because as you grow globally, we're trying to have some sort of consistency in, in, in how we celebrate across the globe. And logistically, it becomes difficult. I mean, throw COVID in and it's yeah. impossible, basically. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, um, it's a great event that everybody looks forward to. And uh, we put a lot of emphasis in how we can help our team. I mean, we're not quite in the Google and Facebook category where I think their revenues per full-time equivalent is enormous. And sometimes we are benchmarked against them, actually, which is a bit of a challenge for us as a partner of Google and Facebook and a service business where our revenue comes from the people delivering those services. Uh, it's different when you're like Google and I think it's like 1.4 or 1.8 million 
in revenue per person that full-time equivalent i mean I'd, I'd be buying my staff ferraris for christmas if that was if that's what we have <laughs> well i won't give jenny any ideas but uh yeah. No, she yeah, she's very she's very um very gutted about the uh, jellyfest being cancelled, and uh, yeah, it'd be a shame that um there's no there's no big hole on the side being uh, done this year. But uh, yeah, no, it was going to be it was going to be last it was last Friday, wasn't it? So it would have been this week. Yeah, so you just in the in the calendar for 2021 now, is it? Exactly. Good stuff. Right. I, so that was that was awesome. I'm now just going to move on to the the final round um of of the bout. Where I just throw. I'm just, I'm just delighted I made it to the final round. Okay, let's see. Exactly, you've done well. You got. Feeling, feeling a bit tired myself, but no, it's uh... <laughs> right. So, uh, in it, the first question I have was, um, I think there's potentially like a few that you sort of mentioned, so I'm interested to see which one you pick. But if you had to pick a before, sort of before after moment in your life that changed it forever in some way, what would it be? I mean, they both happened at the same time, pretty much. I think it's when I held my daughter and said, I've got to look after, I've got to provide and look after you, <laughs> this little human being. Yeah. And any parent will tell you that is just one hell of a moment that it really changes your paradigm. And I pretty much started Jellyfish with Paul at the same time as well. So they're both, they're both pretty much the same age. And I've reimagined what I expect from each, both Jellyfish the business and my daughter along the way. And uh, um, who knows what, what the eventual uh, achievements are going to be. But um, yeah, I would say definitely the birth of my daughter and the birth of Jellyfish. Awesome. And second question is, if Jellyfish wasn't your mission, what do you think would be? Number one golfer in the world. It would have to be, I would be, uh, yeah, paying attention if, if, if I could, because, because this is completely hypothetical, why yeah. can't I be better than Tiger Woods? So yeah, if it's, if, it, if it's going to be a hypothetical question, it would be to be the number one golfer in the world. Love it. Love it. Uh, and the final question, which I ask everyone um, who comes into the ring is um, rather than having a, an intro walk to the unboxing ring, you actually have a, you drop the mic and then you have an outro. So what would, what would be your track that you'd choose for your, for your outro? It would have to be Dr. Dre, the next episode. Cause that is always, it's always about what the next, what's the next episode, always planning, looking, seeing where, where we're going, what direction, what we need to do and change. And so it might be a bit explicit. I don't think <laughs> and it's not going to be for every crowd, but yeah, definitely the next episode. The clean version. But, uh... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, good stuff. That's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good boxing track as well, that one. So uh, I'll round it off nicely. Rob, thanks so much for, uh, for giving up time. It's been brilliant to spar with you. And yeah, hopefully, you hopefully I get to do it once in the future as well. Absolutely. And good luck with the series. Yeah, thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Cheers, Rob. Cheers.